right, amen. Good morning, how's everybody doing? Good, good, good. It's good, so good to be here with you. My name is Preston. I am the children's pastor, uh, but every now and then, uh, a few times a year, I get the opportunity to come out here and share with you what God's put on my heart, so thank you for allowing me to be here with you. Uh, I do love being back there with the kids, though. I'd much rather be back there. Uh, you guys, uh, they're a little bit more intimidating to talk to because they're just like sitting there like looking at you like, so it kind of gets to me. But anyways, um, before I get going, I just want to say a few thank yous. Uh, Pastor Gene and Pastor Kim, thank you so much for allowing me to be up here. Uh, the fact that you guys trust me, uh, it means a lot to share up here and not to fumble over myself. So thank you for that. Uh, I also want to thank our kids team. We have an amazing Rock Kids team. We do. And if you're in here, thank you for serving uh, the way you do. Because if the way you do, uh, I'm able to do this a few times a year, so thank you. They're back there loving on your kids, praying over them, sharing God's love with them, and they do it in a pretty fun way too. So thank you to all you guys. My little brother just flew out this week. <clears throat> He's from Texas. He called me up Monday, and he was like, yo, bro, I want to support you. Can I fly out? I was like, of course. That was awesome. So it means a lot to me that you're here, dude. Thank you so much. And lastly, my wife, I love you so very much. This week has been anything um, of challenges, but we did it, and I can't do it without you. So thank you for the way you support me. I love you. Thank you. Uh, let's pray real quick. Father, we love you. <sighs> Amen. All right. <laughs> so the year's 2018. I had just proposed to my now wife. She said yes, praise God. And we decided that we were going to leave the church that we were currently working for to get married and to do something. We weren't really sure what yet, but we just knew that we were young, in love, and makes for a great rom-com. They're still working on it. And we just decided that we just wanted to go and do something. And around April, I was at my grandfather's funeral up in Pennsylvania. And he passed away, and I met the pastor of the church where the ceremony was, and we get to talking. I find out that he's a pastor of a church. He runs a community center for students after school programs, sporting events, all these things, and an opportunity opens up where he's looking for someone to do a lot of this stuff. And if you know anything about me, I love God, I love sports, and I love working with kids. And so I was like, oh my this sounds amazing. So I fly home, tell Jenna, we're going to Pennsylvania after we get married, and we're going to do this. It sounds awesome. We were living in Texas at the time. So a few months later, we get married, and then two days after we get married, we move to Pennsylvania, load everything up, and the first few days we're there, we're getting settled in, and I realized that that position had already been filled. Uh-oh. <laughs> panic. <laughs> I'm a young married man, and I feel the weight to provide, not only for myself, but now I have a bride to provide for, and I'm like scrambling. So I find the first thing that I can find, and I start bartending and waiting tables. That was my job. And for five months, it was awesome. We had fun. We had a lot of family up there, a distant family, so it was good to be able to connect with them and see them, and I, we loved the time that we had. But about five months in, we kind of looked at each other, and we're like, we're kind of made for more. God, God has more for us. This isn't it. And so we put our heads down. We start applying for jobs, applying here, applying there, applying everywhere. And we just, everything, uh, dozens and dozens of applications went out. And in three months, not one interview, not one callback, not one nothing, just silence, crickets. And we kind of hit this point of like, you know what, we're, we're, we're Christians, we should probably go to God with this. We just kind of had like this moment of like, duh, why did it take us so long? I'm not kidding, it's kind of embarrassing to say, but it took us three months to realize, what do you think God has to say about this? And so we paused for three weeks. We didn't fill out an application, we didn't do anything, and we fasted with the intent that God was gonna bring, God was gonna show us his direction for our life four days after we finished our fast. I get a phone call from a former pastor that used to work at the church. He was like, hey man, how would you like to come to Colorado Springs and do kids ministry? I was like, where is that on the map? Like, we, hadn't, we weren't even looking at anything outside of like a surrounding city, and yet God is like, no, I got a spot for you, but I need you to pause long enough for me to be able to speak into your life. It's a very impactful story to my life because as I was planning for this, this story is just like on my brain of like, 
it's a good representation of why God wants us to pause. And we're going to talk about four ways that pausing helps our life as believers, as, as children of God this morning. But before I do that, in my research, I realized, I came across this, um, her name is Ruth Haley Barton's 10 Signs That You Are Moving Too Fast that you're in too much of a hurry. I'm going to go through them kind of quickly. Um, the first one is irritability. Are you always irritable? And what I want you to do, and I'm going to preface this, I want you to think about your life right now, and if you're too much of a hurry, if any of these apply to you, don't feel bad. I'm on average six or seven out of ten of these, okay, just so you know. All right, first one's irritability. The second one is hypersensitivity. Number three is restlessness when you feel like you can't stop or relax. Compulsive overworking. Number five is numbness. Number six, ex I told you I was gonna go fast. Where's y'all's penmanship? I'm kidding. What number are we on? One? Who said one? <laughs> All right, irritability. Number two, hypersensitivity. Number three, restlessness. Number four, compulsive overworking. Number five <laughs> is numbness. Number six, escapist behaviors. Binge watching too much TV. Now I'm a Stranger Things, Stranger Things fan myself, but too much of a good thing is not a good thing. <laughs> Uh, excessive social media usage. You're scrolling way too much. And then even getting into excessive alcohol use. Number seven, disconnected from your identity or your calling. Number eight, not able to attend, attend basic human needs, sleep, exercise, eating. Number nine, you're hoarding energy. And this last one, number 10, slippage in spiritual practices. Disciplines become less and less frequent. Now, if you connect to any of those or any of those kind of feel like a little stab, you're not alone this morning. And I feel like today, the four things that we're going to learn and talk about will help us with these areas. Because if I'm being honest, I feel like we all have buttons that get pushed from time to time. Am I, am I right? Um, there's a reason why the Jameson household does not have a Rock Family sticker on the back of their car, because one of my wife's buttons, road rage, getting cut off in the, on, on Powers, right there, Powers in Dublin, Whew, she hates it. I'm not going to lie, I have it too, let's just be honest. My little brother, he actually would get so mad when I would drive, because he'd be like, dude, it's not that big of a deal. I'd be like, did you see what he did? He cut me off. He deserves this, you're number one. You know what I'm saying? Like... <laughs> It's a button. It gets pushed. When I was younger, I would mow my grandparents' yard, and when I would, I would get, like, too close to the edge of the neighbor's yard, and if I crossed that line, that was a button for him. He'd come out just waving his finger at me, just shouting at me, like, I'm sorry, you know? That was a button that got pushed. We all have buttons that get pushed, and how we react to those will tell us if any of these things on this list if they affect us. I love C the, this quote by C.S. Lewis. It says that the great thing, if one can, is to stop regarding to all unpleasant things as interruptions of one's own or real life. The truth is, of course, that what one calls the interruptions are precisely one's real life. Let me kind of paraphrase that, because I'm like, huh? If you live your day to day and someone comes into the middle of your day and interrupts you with a conversation or a question and it throws you off, you live too, but too much of a busy life. You are being run by busy. We need to learn to have a life of pause. And if I could reword the title of today's message, it would be the next point. It would be to have, we need to have a life of pause. And we're going to learn by talking about David's life, the early life of David, how he resembled and modeled this life of pause that I'm talking about. So we're going to pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And a little context before we meet David. The king of Israel at the time is Saul. 
He was favored by God. He was a great king, but he, dis- he started to re- disregard God's word, started to disown the things of the Lord. And God told Samuel, who was the prophet, I am removing my favor from him, and I'm going to give it to someone else. So the favor of God has left Saul. And in chapter 16, we're going to pick up in verse 1. It says, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to become king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears of this, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. And they asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Elab, the oldest, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at that things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but I, the Lord, look at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, the second son, the the athlete, and passed in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse had his third, Shammah, passed by. But Samuel said, nor is this this the one the Lord has chosen. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Now, this might just be the kid pastor brain in me, but I think of Jesse in that moment, looking at all seven of his sons and being like, failures, all of you. Just like, (laughs) no, 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 right? Like, and Jesse's like, come on, not one? So, all of the seven, and he said, none of these. So we asked Jesse, are these all of your sons? Jesse goes, oh, you know what? They're still the youngest. He's out tending to the sheep. Samuel said, send for him, for we will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. I think he was bald. Okay, I'm just saying. (laughs) Then the Lord said, rise, anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. (laughs) And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Now, real quick, hold on. Samuel just tells David, I'm going to anoint you as king. You are going to become the new king over Israel. I'm thinking of the next 10 things that's about to happen in my life, that I'm heading to the palace, I'm kicking the sheep to the curb, and I'm about to get some, you know, gold slippers, I'm going to get fine dined, and I'm going to start learning what it means to become king. Let me put that in today's world. If God came down to me right now on this stage and said, Preston, you know what? You're going to win the Masters at Augusta National. Now, if you don't know what that is, it's a golf tournament one of the biggest in the world. And he's like, my favor is upon you and you're gonna go and you're gonna win that tournament. What am I doing tomorrow? Quitting my job, finding the closest golf course and I'm gonna start working on my chipping because it's just, that's just not there. And I'm gonna practice, I'm gonna do everything I can to will this into motion. But what do we see? Samuel does this and then he went to Ram. He left, he peaced out and said, okay, see ya. (laughs) I'm sure there was more context there. And then next we see David. He's back out tending to the sheep. Why is that important? Because the first thing that we can learn from pausing is, number one, pausing is a way to stay reliant on God. David's told he's going to become the new king. I'm, I, I keep reiterating that because that's big news. And he goes to the do the last thing that God told him to do. He goes back to tending the sheep and working on the same craft that he had been working on for so long. You know where I'm going with this. He continued to be faithful to God. God, not my will be done, but yours. You see, when we moved to Pennsylvania, I had to get to a point where I'm like, God, I 
I have nothing else to do. I need you in this moment. I had to pause and allow God to speak into my life and continue to grow me to a point where he could pull me and use me in his timing. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and plans not to harm you and to give you hope and a future. David had a life of pause because when he went back out to herding the sheep, he continued to do what God had called him to do originally, herding the sheep and working on his craft. Now fast forward a couple scriptures. We're gonna jump to, to 1 Samuel 18 and a little context in between this. David had become the armor bearer for Saul. Saul loved David, saw the favor of God upon him. David killed Goliath, and he started to climb the ranks of the Israel army. And at this point in chapter 18, people are singing David's praises in the city of Israel. They're singing, David killed his thousands, or Saul killed his thousands, but David killed his ten thousands. I mean, they're shouting his name, and they're like, yo, this dude is it. You know who else was hearing those shouts? King Saul. And he wasn't excited for him. He got bitter. He got jealous. He envied that because you know why? He saw what was on him because that used to be on King Saul. So he got jealous and tried to kill him two times. He tried to kill David two times. And not like I'm going to poison him and be like, oh no, what happened? Who did this? No, he picked up a spear and hurled it at his head twice. He panicked. He was not living the life of pause and he tried killing David. And when it didn't work, he got scared of David and decided, I'm going to bring my enemies in closer. So he got his daughter and said, David, why don't you become part of our family? Marry my daughter. Now, if I don't live a life of pause, if I'm David, I'm like, yo, King, you crazy. (laughs) Like, I'm going to lose my Jesus on this guy. And be like, you try to kill me. You're plotting against me. Heck no. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm about to lose it. This dude's lost his mind. You're crazy. But what what does David do? He shows honor in this moment. The second thing that pausing does is a great spiritual practice. Colossians 3, 23 and 24, it says, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not human masters. Now this scripture came well after David, but I think it's important to say that I, I believe David had God's spirit He had a heart after God and knew this and said, you know what? I'm not working for you, Saul. I'll be honoring to you, but I know that everything I'm doing is for the Lord. I know that one day I'm going to be in your seat, and maybe I want the person who's in my seat to be honoring to me if I mess up. So he shows honor to his leaders. He shows honor to the people above him. Pausing is a great spiritual practice. Fast forward some more. Saul tries to kill David again and again and again. He even gets David, did I say that right? Saul tried to kill David again and again and again. And even tries to get his best friend, Jonathan, who is Saul's son, to kill him. And Jonathan's like, nah, man, that's not happening. David flees from Israel. He's leaving. He left Israel. Saul hires a thousand men to track down David. They're on a hunt for David to try to kill him. Saul is desperate at this point. He's trying everything in his power to get rid of David. So David flees. He's running away from crazy, all while still going and fighting more crazy. He's still fighting the Philistines. He's still leading the army of Israel and winning battle after battle after battle. And do you know how I know David had a life of pause? In the midst of running from crazy and running to more crazy, in chapter 23, you can read that he is start, it starts the chapter off by saying, God, am I supposed to attack this city? Is this what you have me to do? And God gives him permission, and then he goes and attacks. In the midst of a crazy world, think about your world right now, in the midst of the crazy, I'll even use my own life. When things get crazy and get rattled, the first thing I do is like, okay, I gotta fix it. What do I gotta do to do this? But not David. David wakes up every morning, God, is this what you have me to do? Am I still doing, am I, am I still where you have called me to be? In the life of pause. 
In chapter 24, we find David and his men hiding in a cave. They're hiding from Saul. Da- uh, King Saul is l- tracking him down. He ends up in the same cave as David using the bathroom. Now, in this moment, King Saul's guard is down. His britches are down. He is at the most vulnerable state of his life. And David's men see him. Go to David and say, David, the Lord has delivered your enemies to you. Go and take his life and all this is done. In a moment when we think we have the right answer and the right decision to make, David still pauses. Have you ever felt like you made the right decision before? Maybe you you justified your decision to other people. If you don't know what I mean, if you had to say the words, well, you don't know what they did to me. You're justifying your actions. And maybe they might seem right. I'm not here to say they are or they're not. I'm just here to say the third thing that, that pausing does, it allows us to consider the righteous choice. There's a, there's a right choice and there's a righteous choice. And in this moment, the right choice, when the people you do life with are telling you this is a good thing, do it, take care of this, and all your problems go away, sounds amazing. You know, like, that's not, what Paul, that's not what David did. He paused and considered the righteous choice. God, what should I do in this moment? He walks up to Saul, sneakily, and cuts a little piece of his garment off and then leaves. In Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, as in Christ, God forgave you. David considered the righteous decision. In a place where it was crazy and chaotic, he had a life of pause. In a, in, a, in a place in his life where everything was calm, they were resting, and they had the right answer right in front of them, it looked good, it looked like the right thing to do, he still paused. David modeled a life of pause that we can learn from, I think, but you know, if you continue to read the life of David, we see that he messed up, he entered into sin, then he got into pride, and pride just carried him down to a dark hole, to a point where Samuel had to call him out of his stuff and say, hey, dude, you're, you're not it. It's not it right now. Get your life right. In the midst of all the chaos of, of doing everything wrong, he goes away and pauses. The fourth thing that pausing does is pausing. Allow, it gives permission to the Holy Spirit to change your heart. He had to get away and get his heart right with God because it wasn't. He was going and doing things and acting. He would see something and be, boom, I want it. He'd see something and boom, I'll do it. He forgot to pause. Getting away and pausing gives permission to the Holy Spirit to change your heart. David wasn't perfect. He did live a good life of pause. But there is one who lived a perfect life. And he modeled pause perfectly. His name was Jesus. I love reading about Jesus because multiple, multiple times, many of his miracles, when it happened, he was interrupted by something he was doing. He was teaching, and people would come in and do something. He'd be like, okay, cool. He took time. He lived a life of pause that he wasn't interrupted or he wasn't frazzled by interruption. He welcomed it. And in John chapter 8, I want to read this to you. It's not on your handout. It's not on the screen. I just want you to visualize this scenario for me. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before a group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in in an act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question to trap in order to have a basis uh, for accusing him. There's this woman caught in sin. 
And her consequence of sin is coming right at her. And it's death. And before Jesus, the consequence of sin is death. And it's coming right at her. But Jesus steps in between our sin and the consequence of that and says, pause. He steps in between this woman and these men, and Jesus knelt down to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until there was only Jesus with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No, sir. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. Will you guys stand with me this morning? I want to ask you, what do you do with a message like this? Where do you find yourself this morning? Are you David that, that needs to learn to have a little bit more time in relying on God? Or maybe you're like, you know what, I, I need to work on my spiritual practices a little bit. I just need to pause and get away. If that's you, I encourage you to, to think about what that looks like for you. Find time to pause throughout your day. But maybe you're here this morning, you're like, you know, I'm that woman. I'm the woman caught in adultery and I'm just living a life of sin and I need that Jesus to put a pause in my life. Because if I'm being honest with you, everything I said this morning doesn't happen without Jesus. We can't live a life of pause of this peace that we're talking about if you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And Jesus said, I have come so you may have life and have it more abundantly. I don't know about you this morning, but I want that abundant life. I want that life that he has for me. And if you're in here this morning, you're like, man, Preston, I don't, I don't have that. I want that, but I don't have that. The only way to have that is to invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life. You see, he died for you. He took every form of sin, every mistake, everything that we could do or will ever do and said, I'm still gonna love you. Go and leave your life of sin. But first we have to accept him. We have to say, I believe in you and I want you in my life. And if you haven't done that this morning, I wanna pause long enough to give you that opportunity. So on the count of three, would you just lift your hand? We're just gonna pray for you. We're gonna celebrate you. And you're just saying, God, I, I need you to step in my life. I need that pause. One, two, three. If you're in here this morning. We got one way in the back, back here. Come on. Come on. Another one over here, right here. Praise God. Yeah. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed the service. If you live here in Colorado Springs or you're going to be in the city, I hope that you'll come and experience the service firsthand. And for those of you that are enjoying the ministry and you're being fed to on a weekly basis, I invite you to partner with us financially and make an investment into the mission and the vision of Rock Family Church. And lastly, if you've never made a commitment and a decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, would you make that decision today? Why wait till tomorrow? Why wait till next weekend? I dare you to pray this prayer with me. Would you close your eyes? Would you pray this prayer with me and repeat it? It goes like this. Pray this with me. Say, dear God, forgive me of all of my sins and mistakes. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And I invite him to be the Lord of my life. Thank you for loving me and forgiving me. My life is now in your hands. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Amen. 
hey, thanks for making that commitment. Will you email us at info at rockfamilychurch.com. Tell us about your new decision to stand up big and live strong for Jesus Christ. We'd love to celebrate with you. God bless you guys. We'll see you next weekend.